All right. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining today's Lunch and Learn. Um, we have Gail Grove Scott. She will be discussing the opioid crisis, illegal drug marketing, and policy gaps. Uh, I first of all want to thank everyone who donated to see this talk and listen to Gail uh, talk about her experiences. Uh, Gail Grove Scott is MPH at Health Policy Network. Uh, a public health researcher and a policy advocate, Gail became a whistleblower for the Department of Justice in the record setting criminal case regarding the opioid um, use disorder medication Suboxone. Uh, she later quit the career in pharmaceutical sales and testified as a fact witness in the grand jury case, Purdue Pharma against oxytocin case. Uh, after leaving the industry, she spent three years at the University of the Sciences in Philadelphia, launching the program to educate pharmacists, physicians, and policymakers about substance use, harm, reduction, addiction, and recovery. So I'm going to pass it over to Gail. Um, I ask everyone to please turn off your cameras and mute yourselves, and we can begin. So Gail, take it away. Thanks very much, Kim. Um, uh, today, I'm going to talk about something that uh, I talk about a lot, the opioid crisis, um, and something I've only recently started to talk about publicly, the illegal drug marketing. Um, and policy gaps is one of my favorite topics. Um, I'm going to go through some disclosures really quick. Um, I have a, um, I was a relator in a, a False Claims Act case, the Department of Justice versus Reckitt Ben Kieser Pharma and versus Indivior. I was a fact witness in a Purdue Pharma investigation on a federal level. And, um, and I'm gonna go into more detail about the fact that I was a sales rep with um, several pharmaceutical companies, but two that were involved in opioid litigation. Um, and there's a disclaimer there that is uh, something my lawyers often ask me to include uh, to say that some um, settlements involve the companies um, not admitting to any wrongdoing or liability. Um, so, you know, I think it's important when somebody presents data and, a, and someone who is a researcher like myself that has a background relevant to the subject that I'm researching to talk a little bit about where I worked. I don't usually go into this much detail since I, I wasn't sure. I thought we may have more uh, physician participants and they might be interested in specific companies I work for, um, particularly because I'm doing this talk in Lancaster um, where, which was part of my territory for 16 years in pharma uh, at various times. So there are physicians that um, will see this talk who I may have called on as a, as a pharma rep for one of these medications. I'm not going to read over all of them, but between 1999 and 2016, when I left the industry, I worked for three different companies, one of them twice. And at all three companies, I did promote an opioid, although I did promote other drugs, including uh, when I started birth control pills and antidepressants. Um, it's relevant that I worked for Purdue Pharma in two stints, 2003 for a year, and then later in 2014 for, for about two years before I left. And then I spent seven years at the company, um, the, two, the company that changed its name and now is the, still the company that owns Suboxone, Subutex, or Buprenorphine. Um, I also like to disclose my perspectives because I think that it's important to think about how a person comes to their view of, um, of any policy. Um, and I also come to that not just as a person who was a marketing insider in, uh, for companies that sold opioids, but also as a parent of a person who is in sustained recovery, but who was an overdose su survivor. Um, I have a child that recovered from a heroin use disorder. Um, I'm the sibling of someone who died because of substance use, and I'm a family member of several people whose lives have been impacted terribly by alcohol use disorders. So like, like most people, my um, experience is a little bit colored by, um, by those parts of my background. Um, and the privilege that I have as a, a white woman who uh, came from an educated family and had the privilege of often not encountering the kind of, in my family, the, the kind of justice system consequences that are part of what is known as the war on drugs, um, the, the, the aggressive criminalization of addiction. Um, some of us have been more privileged than others to not face some of those consequences because of certain amount of inherent racism and, um, and classism and other disparities 
in how uh, those consequences are felt. Most importantly, I am a passionate person when it comes to public health policy, and I am a graduate student. I'm a doctoral student at uh, what used to be the University of the Sciences, the Philadelphia College of Pharmacy's parent university um, that just merged with St. Joseph's University. So I'm taking a break right now, but I am a doctoral student at what is now uh, St. Joseph's University in health policy. Um, and, you know, the lectures that I do the most are often, in the past at least, about addiction and about the opioid crisis. Um, I like to think that um, this audience is uh, probably familiar with this, and it's not the subject of my talk, but I couldn't talk about opioid litigation without talking about why opioid litigation exists and the fact that the, um, the opioid epidemic or, or the opioid crisis is really an overdose crisis now. It's not just about opioids, and it's certainly not just about uh, prescription opioids. So although I am going to talk quite a bit today about opioid litigation, um, I just want to be clear, as a public health person, I really, I, and as a researcher, I like to be nuanced, and, and I often point out that the, the, the overdose crisis today was sparked by inappropriate prescribing of prescription opioids and by marketing of prescription opioids, but that was the first wave. And this CDC data makes clear that the way, the second wave of the opioid crisis starting in 2010 was really about heroin. And the third wave that we're, we're really struggling with right now is really about synthetic opioid overdose deaths. And by that, we really mean fentanyl, um, a poisoning of our illicit drug supply by fentanyl. So um, I won't be able to, I won't be going into that in detail in this talk, but I don't even, anytime I talk about um, illegal drug marketing, I, and, and its connection to the terrible public health crisis we're facing today, I like to make clear that this is a multifaceted issue. It needs a multifaceted response. So um, focusing just on prescription opioids is not going to solve our problems in terms of the drug overdose crisis we face today. Um, for many years, I've, folk, I've used this heat map that the New York Times created based on um, CDC uh, data from 2016. And I just want to real briefly show it to you. The red numbers are the higher numbers of overdose deaths. And this is the, a map of the United States from 1999 to 2015. I just think it's hard for us to picture the, the, the depth of the crisis. And so sometimes looking at this and seeing how the overdose crisis changed and the geography of it is a, is a visual that's really striking and mean, meaningful to me. Um, other visuals like this most recent data are also um, just devastating. The fact that we're facing over 100,000 overdose deaths a year and um, we've reached a million in this crisis since the opioid, um, the drug overdose death uh, pandemic or the drug overdose epidemic, and the CDC does call it an epidemic, started. And I did want to connect it to the other public health crisis, the pandemic, because much to our dismay, um, some of the policy innovations and policy changes that we thought were beginning to reduce deaths, um, probably uh, almost entirely, we're sure, because of um, the back some of the the pandemic impacts that happened in 2020 to now have caused an increase rather than a decrease in deaths. So we have a lot of work to do in terms of policy. Um, I do focus on pharmaceutical marketing research, not so much litigation research, and I'm not certainly not an attorney, even though I'd be talking about some legal topics. But I just want to mention that, you know, everything we know about marketing and um, in this field is very limited because there are a lot of data gaps. Um, we do have a wonderful open payments database that was established in 2010 by a Sunshine Act requiring industry to report how much they spend on, in, on physicians and other healthcare providers. But it's, it's a very imperfect tool, as Dr. Hadlin said, um, one of the key authors of the, the study that I have uh, pictured there about association of pharmaceutical industry marketing with mortality. Um, you know, we do know there's a strong association with pharmaceutical marketing and prescribing, but we don't have enough data really to measure it well. Um, we don't know what pharma really spends on marketing. There's very poor funding to this field of research. If, as you can imagine, um, 
it's not something the industry really wants people to do. Um, it's not a very prestigious area and, and, and it's very difficult to get any government funding around this too. So a lot of it's independently funded. Um, so second, uh, and finally, one of the biggest issues when you're studying industry, any kind of business research is the difficulty in getting documents and primary sources. Um, I've been asked to be a primary source now that I'm no longer in the industry. And you know, you have some challenges with that because most of us have signed non-disclosure agreements as part of our employment. And even people that have left industry, um, I found when any, anytime I talk about the, how difficult it is to be a whistleblower in this industry, we'll often share with you that, you know, they're afraid of getting sued um, if they signed a non-disclosure agreements as part of their employment um, or or if they're revealing information that may be pr proprietary. So it's one of the challenges. And I'm going to talk, the reason I bring it up is I'm going to talk about it later when I talk about policy solutions. Um, as I said, you know, I'm not going to go into detail on this data, but there is a huge amount of data around how marketing did and does still increase opioid prescribing. And as someone who was an insider and who was an opioid marketer, you know, I was, I didn't make the big bucks and, and I did get paid well uh, because I wasn't successful. I mean, the, the reason there were so many of us selling um, um, opioids and the reason there's a, a vast other kind of marketing going on is because it's very successful. But as a researcher, you look at both sides. I do want to say that the industry says this is a false narrative. They're saying that we exchange critical information to improve patient care. And I am not, as a pharmaceutical researcher, here to say that pharmaceutical marketing shouldn't exist. In fact, because of uh, freedom of speech laws in the United States, we really can't uh, uh, get rid of it, um, not in the way, and we, we can't even prohibit direct-to-consumer advertising, it appears, like, uh, even though we're one of only two uh, countries in the world that allows it. Um, but much of the marketing is commercial free speech. So you can't always stop it, but you can regulate it and you can fill gaps in information and data. So as a policy researcher and somebody who's really interested in changing the problems of industry marketing, um, at least as I see them and as some of our data shows, um, I think that we have to look at that aspect that we can't always stop it, that businesses do have a re an ability to market. And to some extent, sometimes, you know, they may be, uh, they may be useful. They may be improving patient care. I don't go into it in detail in this talk, but there is a, quite a bit of data that um, the, the people being marketed to believe that it's useful. And I can certainly speak to that because I have very good and close relationships with many physicians, um, probably some physicians that'll be listening to this talk. And I'm, I'm not here to denigrate that, um, but there's many risks. Um, just like when we prescribe and we have to weigh the benefits and risks, we have to weigh the benefits and risks of, of your relationship with industry and, and how you choose to be marketed to and, and maybe don't choose to be marketed to in case of a lot of the hidden marketing. Um, I do want to bring this up because it's very timely and many of you may be thinking about it. Um, when we talk about the causes of, um, of uh, uh, inappropriate opioid prescribing, which I'm going to touch on today, um, you know, certainly much of the focus is on not on marketing by the pharmaceutical industry, it's on the choices that doctors made as prescribers. And there was a really interesting uh, Supreme Court case that just happened um, saying that um, the DEA and Department of Justice and other prosecutors have to focus on intentional bad actors. So I think that's good news for, for all of us, I think, in public health who are really concerned about um, an overemphasis that has, has uh, kind of swung the pendulum back from over prescribing to being scared of prescribing. So I just wanna mention that this case is out there. It really speaks to the difficulty in public health law because um, you know, I think these particular cases that went to the Supreme Court, court Dr. Ruin and, and the other physician um, were really egregious cases. When you read the details of what um, the, in terms of kickbacks, um, one of the second doctor was charged with intentional homicide. They were pretty egregious cases, yet they are the cases that many people are um, pleased to see were taken to, the, to court to get this outcome. 
Um, it does not mean that the doctors will be released from prison or will, um, will have their sentence changed at all because the Supreme Court just sent it back to the, um, to the, to the lower level course to, to look at, to see how they, the jury was instructed. Um, so it may be that the, the physicians in these cases will not see their sentences change. But we do know that um, when we talk about opioid litigation, uh, in fact, it's one of pharmaceutical companies, the industry's defenses is to focus on the prescribers and say, you know, it's not about us. It's, a, it's not a how we market it to the prescribers. It's the choices the prescribers make. And um, I believe as a public health proponent that we need to have balance here and we need to look at doctors that are following medical norms and may unintentionally go outside those norms versus doctors that are intentional bad actors who deliberately for money run pill mills and, and accept kickbacks and really don't care about what's best for patients. Um, for sure, we can spread the blame as well about why um, there are so many problems in terms of our policy oversight of pharmaceutical marketing. Um, there's quite a bit of information. I just, I mentioned, a, I showed a journal article here about FDA fail failures that contributed to the opioid crisis and then a, uh, by Dr. Kolodny and then a, um, the New York Times headline. There's quite a bit of, um, of literature, academic literature around the failures of regulators. So I'm not going to focus on that, but I just wanted to mention that um, we know that the, the blame can be shared in terms of why we have had so many policy failures around oversight of um, opioid prescribing. Um, in pill mills is a particular interest of mine. And when I did some, some talks earlier um, in my career about pill mills, you, you just couldn't, it, you couldn't escape how egregious it was in certain areas. Uh, here in Pennsylvania, we had, a, we had some problems, but in Fort, Florida, at one point, it was a huge hotspot for inappropriate prescribing and the state for years did nothing about it. And federal regulators were very slow. It took many years, um, 90, and that, that note, 90 out of 100 doctors in the whole country, the top 100 doctors in the country that purchased oxycodone to distribute it out of their offices, 90 of them were in Florida in 2010. And um, so regulators there were very slow to look at inappropriate and, and dangerous uh, dispensing and prescribing of opioids. It's improved since then, um, but it just speaks to the fact that uh, we need improved regulation on multiple levels. The issue of regulatory capture, I'll speak about a little bit more, but I'm not focusing on this talk, but we know that it, it is, you know, the, the pharmaceutical uh, lobbying spend uh, is at record levels and the extent that there's a, a revolving door between regulators and industry is well known. Um, you know, here's some of the, uh, the, the publications that have really caught the interest of the public in light of what we know now about Purdue Pharma's uh, aggressive marketing. Um, we often say they're marketing and promotion of OxyContin. Um, one of my favorite journal articles, I just think it's really comprehensive and it's by a, a physician who was on the ground himself dealing with this. It's by Dr. Art Van Zee. Um, from dating back to 2009 is this journal article from the American Journal of Public Health. I really look at it as a model of the discussion of um, the literature and the evidence around uh, a commercial marketing that was very successful that brought some really poor public health outcomes. So I won't go into a lot of detail on this today, but you may be familiar with some of these books. Um, the Dreamland book by uh, Sam Quinones was, was groundbreaking in how it looked at the supply side changes from drug cartels in Mexico as, um, as the drug crisis evolved from, prescription, from strictly prescription drugs to heroin. Um, Barry Meyer's book, Painkiller, was one of the earliest ones to really look at the promotion and marketing of OxyContin. And he was able to update it because a lot of data became unsealed as part of um, opioid litigation, became more available. Um, I get asked a lot about Beth Macy's um, uh, book, Dope Sick, which has uh, become a very well-known series on, mini series on uh, the Hulu cable channel. And I'll tell you, if, certainly it's a drama 
And I, you know, it's meant to be dramatic for TV, but I, as you know, some of, as someone who worked twice for Purdue Pharma and studies pharmaceutical marketing, I can tell you that what's underneath of it is, is mostly facts. It's, it's a real world um, information. A lot of the, the information in that book, some of it was updated more recently. It's only loosely based on the book is accurate. Um, and then my, uh, a very, very excellent book about this issue of the aggressive marketing and that goes into depth about how the family that started Purdue Pharma, the Sacklers, were innovators in pharmaceutical marketing. Um, it's, it was by Patrick Radin Keefe's book, Empire of Pain. I highly recommend it. I have to tell you that one of the things that was so shocking to me when I made the choice I did to, to leave industry. Um, some of you uh, came in a little late, so missed my disclosure at the beginning. But um, you know, when I worked for Purdue Pharma twice, um, each time I believe that they had they had reached a point where they were changing their marketing. I was told that when I was hired and I believed it. Um, and, and when I read some of the information Patrick Radin Keefe wrote in a groundbreaking New York Times article that then later became the book Empire of Pain about the marketing background of um, Arthur Sackler, who was a, a genius in the 50s, who was doing advertising agency, very innovative marketing around benzodiazepines and some other controlled substances and how that probably led to the, to the expertise of this particular company, as well as the entire industry in terms of marketing of controlled substances and just marketing in general. Um, I was shocked. I, I did not know that history um, until I became a researcher myself and started to, to, uh, to read the literature. And um, much of the information was only recently disclosed. So I guess if I had started researching this 10, 15, 20 years ago, I wouldn't have been able to, to have some of this information. It just wasn't available. Um, so we do know a lot more than we used to. I will mention the industry's aggressive marketing of opioids, specifically for chronic pain and specifically to expand how we prescribe, was not just about one drug. It was not just about OxyContin. It was about expanding opioid prescribing overall. And so I think that that's really relevant too, that um, you know, the sophistication of pharmaceutical marketing, and we know this is not restricted to controlled substances, it's true of all pharmaceutical products. Um, the industry has become so sophisticated that they really focus on expanding the category of prescribing as much and, and, the, and, and teaching the disease state that they want to sell uh, their product for as much as they do promoting their one particular branded product. Um, and that's part of the sophistication around industry marketing. Um, I'm going to talk, I'm going to go back and forth a little bit talking about industry marketing and talking about um, opioid litigation and, and how the, reg, the regulators have responded. Um, one source that I, I cite quite a bit is Public Citizen. Um, that is a nonprofit that has um, some really comprehensive data that um, it's often used by academic researchers because they just put it all in one place around the, the kind of civil and, and criminal penalties that the industry as a whole has had to pay and, um, and different kinds of litigation. Um, I am, I'm not going to go into detail about this particular type, but one reason it's relevant, False Claims Act cases are one type of litigation. They uh, they're definitely have been part of the opioid litigation, and it's the part that I'm most familiar with as a whistleblower. Um, the False Claims Act is a law that goes dates back to the Civil War. Uh, the time Abraham Lincoln started it, and it has to do with um, in it protecting insiders who want to file lawsuits on behalf of the federal government to um, around federal dollars that are being misused fraudulently or, um, or illegally. And if you have inside information that can help the government make the case, you can file a False Claims Act case. And this is the public um, citizen data around financial penalties. I just want you to see um, the, the red is the pharmaceutical 
industry. Um, the blue is the defense industry because false claims act cases are, are very prominent in healthcare, but they are, um, you can file them in any kind of industry where government money is being spent. Um, of course, healthcare being such a huge part of our tax dollars um, and, and some a number of changes to the law in the 80s that made it easier to file and, and provided increased protections and incentives for whistleblowers have it really increased the, their use in healthcare. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on that, but I'm, I welcome questions afterwards because um, I just wanted to cover a, a lot of things kind of broadly and I assumed you'll ask more questions if you want specifics. Um, and again, pharma industry penalties. Um, public Citizen a few years ago totaled it up to, to 30 billion, but it's much higher than that now. And if the opioid litigation settlements um, are, are actually received um, and, and we're still waiting to hear how much of that is gonna get paid out, um, this number is gonna skyrocket. So um, it's not just penalties, it's also settlements. This is specifically looking at 25 years of civil and criminal financial penalties. And, um, and you know, as I mentioned, there's many types of violations that can be um, fraudulent. It may be overcharging. It may be illegal or unlawful promotion. Um, at one time, kickbacks was huge and it still is. Um, um, monopoly practices is more is more recently something that I think is starting to increase in terms of, of healthcare. We have a lot of challenges around the patent system and it's fraudulent. Well, I guess the right word isn't fraudulent, but the um, the use of the patents to block competition. There's times when that is appropriate and and uh, and legal, and there's times when it is illegal. And as you'll see, um, there's many that's become a part of a number of false claims act cases. Um, the biggest area is um, is overcharging, but how this is divided up varies a lot. One thing we're starting to see. Um, in opioid litigation that I'll mention later is also racketeering charges. So there's a lot of different ways that the industry violations are uh, contributing to um, these huge numbers of fines and settlements. Um, there's a lot of ways that public health law can respond to um, challenges, policy challenges, like how our opioid crisis was sparked by overprescribing and inappropriate marketing. Um, and in terms of the drug overdose crisis, I just want to mention, because I, I as again, as a researcher, I, I don't like to avoid the nuance. Um, I think it's important to think of all these other ways that we use public health law other than litigation. Um, here's just a few that I, I enjoy talking about and you've probably heard quite a bit about. Um, and I, I, I think that um, the, the biggest challenge is um, how we, we balance trying to deal with supply side versus demand side policy responses. Um, in Pennsylvania, we're starting to see um, the, the impact of um, a, a really an, uh, innovative focus by the federal um, prosecutors on civil rights enforcement around the ADA or the, um, the Disabilities Act um, to reduce discriminations against people using medications for addiction treatment or um, the term, which is the term MAT or medications for opioid use disorder, the pharmacotherapy for opioid use disorder. In Pennsylvania right now, the jails and justice system in general is being sued by uh, the Federal Civil Rights Office of the um, Department of Justice for um, denying access to appropriate medical treatment, including pharmacotherapy for opioid use disorder. That's an area that I'm very interested in as a researcher. I've been involved in for quite some time looking at that uh, discrimination issues around the, um, the um, ADA. Um, one area that in public health um, we often use as an example when we talk about opioid litigation is, um, is previous types of litigation around public health, particularly tobacco. So there's a lot of literature looking at tobacco use and how the, um, the very unusual uh, large multi-district um, multi litigation around tobacco, which became a, um, a multiple settlement um, that, was, that we'll talk about, um, is really 
being used as a model to some extent on what's happening with opioids right now, targeting companies manufacturing, distributing, and selling prescription opioids. Um, the tobacco settlement, um, uh, it was known as the multi-settlement, multi is a 25-year payout. Well, we're past that now, uh, but originally it was meant to be at least $206 billion, but they anticipated it going as high as $300 billion because of future payouts. Um, the five largest tobacco companies settled with the state governments. I, I'm just picturing, there's a reason why I wanted to show you some, some of the medical historians um, and, and medical journalists, um, prominent books around um, the tobacco industry and what happened in this um, settlement, because some of these books are, are very new and this settlement started you know, 30 years ago. Why do we have so many books coming out just now? Um, this uh, book by um, Sarah Milov just came out two, three years ago, at, at the beginning of the pandemic, 2019, 2020. Um, this book by Richard Kruger um, was published in the mid 90s. So this is almost 30 years of, um, of, of, of prominent award-winning analysis of public health litigation around tobacco. And I, one of the reasons we have such good scholarship on this, and that I hope someday we will have good scholarship around the opioid settlements and the opioid litigation is because the settlement in the tobacco situation um, by the state governments required all the documents to be archived. So, you know, when I spoke in the beginning about how difficult it is to do research around, a, around business marketing, um, you can't do the research without the inside documents, without the primary sources and the, the huge um, tobacco archives, because the data was not sealed in all these court cases like it often is in opioid litigation um, and other types of litigation is one of the reasons why we have these really excellent and detailed and really thoughtful scholarship around industry capture. All the same things I just talked about with opioid litigation happened with tobacco, regulatory capture, the government being complicit with the interests of business of the, the interests of the public health, um, all kinds of strategies to obscure the dangers of smoking and the, to obscure the risk of cancer that industry focused on. All of those things are things that we still see today in industry in other industries and certainly in pharma. And the reason we have a good insight to it is because the documents were released. Um, public health litigation opioids, um, I'm just gonna speed through this a little bit because I see I'm, I need to speed up my time. Um, we have multiple kinds of litigation. The multi-district litigation, which involves over 3000 litigants, lit litigants is huge. And that has to do with civil lawsuits by local governments. Um, and some of that is because in the history of tobacco litigation, um, the states got everything and they misspent a lot of the money. Um, it wasn't spent on public health like it should have been. So I think at least scholars, uh, public health law scholars say that this is the reason why we're seeing such diverse groups because of that history. Um, it's not just uh, manufacturers, it's also distributors, it's also pharmacy, um, the huge, largest pharmacy companies. So um, right now, we're looking at probably around 26 billion to date will uh, is is has um, is part of what's being called the global settlement that has been proposed. Um, it's been accepted by the state attorney generals, but there's still some 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 litigation around it by some of the litigants who didn't want to accept it. Um, the Purdue case was originally settled at about 4.5 billion, where Purdue um, agreed to accept um, accept fault in some cases, um, but but. But also because of their bankruptcy, Purdue um, avoided um, a lot of the, uh, well, they really were able to jump ahead of a lot of what is happening in litigation because um, when the company begins, declares bankruptcy, which is a, a very common thing now in terms of strategies for the companies, the government starts to worry they're not going to get their money. So we're, we're looking at maybe $6 billion from Purdue, not just the 4.5 billion they started with. Um, and there's still a chance there could be some criminal penalties, but right now it's been mostly civil. Um, the civil lawsuits by the attorney generals is just a part of this. Um, 
is uh, like in the tobacco settlement. There's also um, a lot we don't know yet about what's gonna happen with um, generic manu opioid manufacturer Malik Drott and, um, and multiple civil enforcement actions and criminal prosecutions. So it's, I'm, I'm, as I said in the beginning, I'm not a, a public health law expert. I'm a policy, uh, uh, policy research um, is where I'm focusing. Um, the Opioid Settlement Tracker, which um, is an excellent resource because it's such a difficult amount of data, um, is something I would really recommend if you want to delve into this a little more. Um, one thing that as a policy person I often think about is what are the public health guardrails around um, focusing on illegal marketing and, and illegal um, actions and civil and criminal cases versus um, what is the benefit of, um, of a pharmaceutical medication, specifically around opioids. Um, one thing that my research has shown is that we're really lacking standards for, for discussing the threshold of abuse and diversion that we're willing to accept. Because when you, as, as um, some of you are physicians and you know that any, any medication you prescribe has benefits and risks, and to some extent, the conversation around controlled substances doesn't, always really address what level of, of misuse is acceptable. And, and unfortunately, that's because we haven't done a good job with this conversation. Um, a, a scholar back in 2007 um, addressed this, and I haven't seen any change that we're really not seeing what is the answer to this as a society that we're willing to accept. And um, it's one of the reasons that we struggle so much with the issues of opioid litigation. Um, Purdue's first settlement was in 2007, $600 million for felony misbranding. Now in 2019, 20, 21, 22, wherever the settlement's going to land because it hasn't been finalized, um, we may see $6 billion um, being paid. Um, in the first case, um, the company um, pled guilty to felony misbranding, not the, the, the owners or the, the, the privately held uh, board. Um, but as you can see, that was not a huge, I mean, it was a huge find at the time. It was, it was fairly, it was almost a record, um, quickly surpassed by other pharmaceutical litigation, but it was a limited amount of OxyContin revenue. It's something that I've said before when I talk about being a whistleblower. It's a little frustrating sometimes because you feel like, um, do companies just see this as a cost of doing business? And how do we change that? Um, the INSYS case, I, I'm not going to go into detail on this one, but I have to say that personally, the thing that made me want to quit working in the industry was my frustration when I heard about this case. I thought that companies were going to change in terms of their marketing of controlled substances. And in the INSYS case, it was just egregious um, misbehavior. And they were a, a case where the government used a mafia type of prosecution. They used a racketeering prosecution against this company that promoted a, um, a fentanyl spray. It was a fairly small company in the scheme of pharma, um, but um, the, the amount of, uh, of egregious misbehavior and, um, and outright kickbacks that the, the government um, proved and that they uh, ple pled guilty to were somewhat unprecedented. And, and the fact that some of the pharmaceutical reps that worked for them uh, were deliberately hired because they did not know much about pharmaceutical marketing. And in fact, they hired people with no college degree, no training in healthcare, and um, as, as, as rather uh, notoriously, um, uh, mentioned quite a bit, one of their pharmaceutical marketers who was promoted to a manager had a background as a um, exotic dancer. Um, it's just, it was just shocking to me and, and really disturbing that in after decades and decades of the government saying that our prosecution of pharmaceutical companies is going to change the way they behave, we saw this case in the 20, um, 2010s and it was 2014, 2015, when this information started to come out. And I just, I just was shocked. Um, and so, yes, people serve jail time and the government did not do that very often before. There's very few examples of pharmaceutical executives going to jail. And the case I was involved in was one of them. But, um, you know, I sometimes wonder if it will make a difference. 
Um, here's the case that I was involved in, as I disclosed in the beginning. Um, I was a, a seven-year uh, senior salesperson for the company that promoted Suboxone, and um, the civil and criminal settlements in this case, um, from I, I was fired, um, and um, I believed it was because I had been speaking out about some concerns I had about exaggerated marketing in 2012. Um, in 2013, I um, filed one of those sealed False Claims Act cases. And when the case was settled, there were a total of six whistleblowers. Two were outside physicians. Um, uh, my case and the case of several of my, my colleagues or former colleagues were all part of this, um, this overall uh, civil settlement. But there was also a criminal indictment and criminal settlement of Indivior. So uh, the two companies, the parent company, Reca Benkeiser, settled for $1.4 billion, and the spinoff division that still markets um, um, Suboxone medications today, Indivior, settled for $600 million. Um, a, a, a subsidiary pled guilty to a felony, which is a tactic they often do so that the companies can um, continue to market to the federal government. So the, the current version of Indivior um, can continue to market to the government just, uh, because they did not plead to a felony, just the subsidiary did. Um, two top executives served six months of jail time and pled guilty to misdemeanors. Um, however, as I mentioned in a, a talk I did recently about being a whistleblower, it, it is disturbing to me that um, the company still chose to give a $2 million bonus, um, $2 million in, um, in bonuses to the CEO, even after he had uh, resigned and gone to jail. Um, what does that say about corporate priorities? I, I just don't know. Um, when they said, well, you know, um, we're not going to take back um, or do a clawback of funds from um, the executive that was uh, at the top of the company when um, a case that cost the company millions um, was settled. I mean, it just baffles me. Um, one of the things as a policy researcher that I, I'm starting to look at to pull some of my, um, my suggestions about filling the gaps in policy is by looking at these corporate integrity agreements that happen almost every time after a pharmaceutical company comes part of litigation. And they've certainly happened in all the opioid litigations. Um, again, it's a, it's a whole talk in itself how these work. And I'm just gonna use one as an example of uh, the Indivior agreement, the corporate integrity agreement said that um, they would stop using data uh, that they had about healthcare professionals to uh, target their marketing and sales promotion. They would stop having salespeople call on doctors that they knew were inappropriately prescribing, which is one of the key parts of their settlement. The company did know that there were doctors that were inappropriately prescribing. And in fact, the company, um, the Department of Justice said that um, the Suboxone helpline, the patient referral line, actually referred patients to doctors the company knew were inappropriately prescribing or breaking the federal regulations around prescribing. Um, that was a part of the um, one of the, the allegations that was settled. And um, although one of the sales forces was eliminated as part of the CIA, which is an unusual feature, um, there are, there's still promotion of their um, long acting injectable forms of Suboxone going on right now, um, Sublicay excuse me, and some other medications the company promotes. Um, there's a number of reporting and penalties. So that's usually what a corporate integrity agreement does. But what disturbs me is why do we have these policy solutions to improve marketing compliance that is supposed to be heavily regulated by the FDA? Why do we have these policies happen after companies have been found guilty? Um, it's, it's something that's really um, struck me when I found out that was the case. And I didn't even know that was the case when I started in this field. Um, so I'm going to jump through this because I'm, I'm running a little long now. Um, for example, Purdue, uh, just like um, I uh, was alleged in the Indivior case by the Department of Justice, Purdue also knew that they were, um, there were doctors inappropriately prescribing and um, they, they waited to promote, to, to tell the FDA about some of the data that they had uh, until it was advantageous to the company when they were about to market it a new abuse deterrent formulation. The LA Times broke that story. That story was another thing that really made me feel, start to feel differently about um, working in this field. 
um, because it was information I didn't know. And I often found information about the companies I work for being reported by investigative journalists. And it was just something disturbing to not know what was happening in my own field where I thought I was an expert. Um, so in a case study that I have uh, spoken on at some academic conferences, looking at uh, both Purdue Pharma and um, Rekha Binkies or Pharma and Divior, um, there's very uh, ample evidence that the company did not notify authorities when they knew there were problem and unsafe prescribing. So, you know, that brings some policy solutions into play when we talk about what's wrong. Um, I'm not gonna be able to address everything, but one thing that I think that is innovative that we should think about is just addressing, you know, as I said, how do we get to what is appropriate pr promotion when we don't know what is medically unnecessary prescribing? So it came out in the Ruin case. Um, there's not clear definitions of it. Um, and when we focus just on the supply chain around distribution, because there have been a number of big settlements in that, um, that some of that public citizen data and the data I showed you earlier around distributors and how, how many um, cases are involving them, um, it's just not clear what are the standards for the industry to share their detailed data with authorities in, in terms of, um, in, you know, deterring public health harms? And what is the role of the sales rep? We, that information doesn't exist. So I did some policy analysis around that. And, and there's just really some obvious reasons, or maybe they're not obvious, but you have to look at the financial conflicts of interest, the difficulty around proprietary information, the fact that industry guidelines are silent on mandated reporting. Um, if you're a healthcare provider, you have to, you're mandated to report when you know patients are going to be harmed or when you know a colleague is impaired. We don't have those kind of clear guidelines in industry marketing. The regulatory and legal um, requirements are somewhat um, obscure. We don't have good risk definition. And there's a lot of disagreement around areas that a professional scope and autonomy and the responsibility of all the actors in the supply chains around pharmaceutical products in general, but specifically controlled substances and opioids. Um, so, um, you know, when we talk about the ethics um, and the challenges between doing, doing good and preventing harm, beneficence, uh, you know, a, a key ethical concept, there's a point where um, we know for physicians, sometimes you have to report a colleague who may be uh, potentially causing harm to patients. Why doesn't industry have to report um, potential harm? Why don't salespeople have to do that? Um, I, I just don't, I didn't understand why we don't have a duty to warn in the industry in the way that you as a healthcare provider, a nurse, a physician, or a pharmacist has. So um, this is something I've been talking about. I'm actually presenting at a conference, an addiction conference this fall, and I'll, I'll hopefully have a paper um, to submit for publication at the same time around some of these areas. One thing that I talk about in, in that paper is the fact that we don't have any kind of occupational licensing around the people who work in healthcare. So unlike everybody else in healthcare, they don't have any kind of um, requirements for licensing standards. They don't have the kind of ethics code that you as healthcare providers have, and they don't have any independent, non-commercial, non-biased education. In my 16 years as a pharma rep, the education that I got that made me expert on my, my medications so that I could present them to, my, to the people I was calling on, it all came from the companies I worked for. It was never independent. It was never non-biased. At least some continuing education that people who are doing marketing and promotion to healthcare providers should get should be independent. Um, we need clear standards around the, the, the issues I brought up earlier about what is dangerous for illegitimate prescribing and dispensing. You know, the, the new Supreme Court ruling may inform us into, you know, what, how we define that, but we need to define it. Um, and then, I, you know, I, I kind of harped on the improvement of research because as a researcher, I want to see, I want the information to be available. You know, as an insider, you know, I mentioned in the beginning, I have to worry about getting sued if I disclose information that I signed a non-disclosure agreement around. Why? does the bulk of the settlements in pharmaceutical cases um, leave the, the critical information that was uh, found in discovery, why does it leave it sealed? In most cases, this information is not made public. So just like the tobacco industry 
uh, archive brought this huge amount of research so that we could really look at you know, policy gaps and how we can fill them in the tobacco industry, that kind of business marketing, that information should be available everywhere. And I propose that we should add sales and marketing materials to the online database where we're putting payment information. The industry says those are proprietary, but I'm saying, you know, it's become public at the point that it's distributed in, in public to a healthcare provider. As soon as a physician is shown it, it's public information. And we, maybe we could crowdsource some of the scrutiny that the FDA has not been able to do properly of sales and marketing materials and certainly investigative journalists and researchers and pub, patient advocates could have access to them. Um, I won't speak more about increased enfor enforcement and penalties, but as I mentioned, if it is just the cost of doing business and just a fraction of your profits when you do illegal marketing and you, and you have to get caught and pay a fine, then what is the incentive for companies not to keep doing it? Um, so we, we do need to look at the penalty side as well. Um, you know, just in closing, I'm not going to go into this, but we do in detail, but um, we do have other ways that we try to address the problems of the opioid crisis that are not around litigation, and those are all very important. Um, it's only recently we've gotten to some of the most important ones, which are really about demand reduction and, um, and safe supplies, and that will really address the problems we have now with the illicit poisoning, or the, the poisoning of our illicit um, supply of drugs with fentanyl. Um, harm reduction is going to be key to that as a public health researcher. I hope that you'll, you'll invite some people to talk to you about that in the future. Um, so I, I covered a lot of ground and um, I, I certainly welcome any questions or comments that you have. Um, I have been asked to speak to maybe kind of narrow in and speak in some more detail on some of these topics. Um, you know, at, at, at maybe a future talk because the scheduling of this right at the 4th of July is, as Kim um, said in the beginning is a little challenging. So we, we didn't get uh, some of the people that wanted to attend. Um, but um, I'd like to really go into more detail of some of the policy gaps that most fascinate me and then be able to answer any questions you have about, um, about any of this research or, or about my experiences as someone who went from being an industry insider um, to being a whistleblower and now being a researcher. So I thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Gail. I know I have a question. Um, your recommendations that you posted, uh, do you see any of them coming to fruition at any point, or do you think it's uh, a long road ahead? Well, um, in terms of increased enforcement and penalties, that's happening, but the profits are so are increasing so much as well. One wonders about the impact. Um, the increased um, the, the, the attempt to put more hold more CEOs accountable. Um, you know, the, there's only been a few cases: the Insys case and the Sabah. Oxum case where, um, and very few other, there's a few um, other cases, but very few where a CEO served jail time. And in the past, for example, back in 2007, when Purdue Pharma uh, pled guilty in their first corporate integrity agreement, um, nobody served any, any time. And the company board and the family that was involved in a lot of the marketing wasn't even um, brought into the lawsuit. So, so I think that they've learned from that and they're trying to make some changes. Um, the opioid industry archive now exists, so a lot of the documents from the multi-district litigation will be made public, um, so that's great news. That was an important thing that we learned from the tobacco case, um, but there's many, many other civil and criminal and, um, and other types of litigation where we don't get that information. A lot of what I know about Purdue Pharma was because not because I worked there, it's because of what I found as a, res as a researcher um, from documents that were unsealed. So that we still have a ways to go, I think, on that. And the False Claims Act cases, as in my personal experience, I've learned they don't incentivize the attorneys involved and the prosecutors involved to make information public. They focus on, on the bottom line number, what's gonna happen, who's gonna plead guilty, what the, what the, the, you know, the level of the, the guilty plea is gonna be, um, or in many cases, nobody pleads guilty and it's all about what's the biggest number we can get from industry in this case. They really don't care 
about um, disclosing the documents. And, um, and I wish there was a policy lever that could force them to do that um, just as a, as a researcher. Um, I think the protocols and standards, that's, that part's gonna be really difficult. Um, pharmaceutical licensing, actually, I, I'm sorry, I left out a slide that I use in some other talks. Um, that has happened in two states. So um, in two states and two cities, and actually there's a, there's a couple of other states that are approaching that. Um, but Philadelphia tried to pass an occupational licensing law. I think it had some provisions that weren't really well written, but it um, it didn't um, it didn't um, it got shot down <laughs> three years ago. So it's very difficult to have to do this. I believe that if we um, pass a federal law require ring occupational licensing, that would be the way to go to get those 40 something other states to follow through and do some kind of occupational licensing. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, if anybody else has any questions for Gail, please feel free to unmute yourselves or, um, oh, I see one from uh, Dr. Zervanos here. He asks, how is fentanyl coming into the US from China, if you know? Um, in the mail is what I've heard. I've been to some DEA lectures and read some of their documents around that. And at least in the beginning, a lot of the fentanyl and the fentanyl precursors were actually coming through the mail. Um, China has, Crack, with, with, because the US government um, were, reached out and has been working with China, um, they have um, addressed some of that, um, but now it's shifted. And now a lot of it is being produced in Mexico um, in labs. So, um, you know, sometimes the labs are using, from what I've read from the DEA, they're using uh, uh, chemicals that they're getting from China, um, but, we've had major shifts. And that's there's something that uh, in harm reduction lectures, they call the iron law of prohibition. And what that law says is that once you, you know, hammer down on one kind of uh, substance that you wanna prohibit, another kind of substance will pop up. And that's what we saw with fentanyl. Um, one of the key public health recommendations is that as a government, the United States has to continue to develop good relationships with these countries. Um, as you saw in the previous administration, we had a very kind of hostile relationship with China and, um, and with Mexico uh, around border issues. And to some extent that, that made it difficult for us to do some of the work we needed to collaborate with them on reducing the harms of these chemicals being distributed. Thank you. Um, any other questions, feel free to unmute or put them in the chat. Um, I'll give it a minute or two. Um, again, thank you so much, Gail, while people are thinking if they have any. Um, as mentioned, uh, Gail uh, agreed to, at a later date, uh, give a part two to this talk as it is a very important topic. Um, and we should have more eyes and ears on it. Um, but I do want to thank everyone who came and who listened to the talk. Even if you, you came in late, you still heard quite a bit of important information. Uh, so I really want to thank Gail again for taking the time out of her schedule to do this for us. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Gail. Um, You're very welcome. <laughs> uh, and I look forward to that second part. Uh, this is fantastically interesting. Um, the up, next upcoming Lunch and Learn is going to be on August 1st. It will be one of our um, interns will be discussing her time interning here and her research on uh, women's health and the plain community. Uh, it will be by Samantha Phillips. She's a student at Elizabethtown, so keep an eye out for that. Um, it doesn't look like we have any other questions, so I want to thank everyone for taking the time. And again, thank Gail and hope everyone has a wonderful day today. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye everyone.